what's good, free world? This is your favorite prisoner, King, hosting the new Ipsy Dixie Shank Radio collab podcast. Today I have ECC11 with us again, and I want to do something a little different on today's episode than what I usually do. Um, a lot of people who follow me on Twitter know a little about me, um, that I've been in prison since I was 16 years old, that I've been in prison almost now 16 years as well. Uh, I started with two life sentences, and now I have nine years left uh, due to uh, long legal battles that, that, that I put on for, for years and years and years. And I actually learned to be a, 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 I actually became a paralegal in here. And, and a lot of people that, that, that is on here know me, know that, and um, I at least heard little parts of my story. But a lot of people who may follow me for my political beliefs or just, you know, that I am a prisoner... And I appreciate it, but I also feel kind of kind of taken away from just being that one prisoner that everyone knows. Uh, a lot of people do not know many of us in here. A lot of people don't know many of these brilliant, brilliant minds and brilliant artists and brilliant lives that, that, that are hidden in these plantations down here, hidden in these alleys and, and, and these dark, dark dungeons. So today what I'm doing... I want to uh, go ahead and interview ECC11. And real quick, man, this 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 manito, this this brother of mine is is basically my godfather's godfather. So the person that initiated me into this, he basically initiated him. And he's also a revolutionary mentor, not only to me but many of us in the Almighty Latin King Queen Nation here in the Florida plantations. So I want to start, man, and and just let you know that. This episode, we're going to be uh, taking a trip, a journey down the mind of ECC1. <laughs> so what's up, my dude? How you been, man? <coughs> peace, peace, freedom, and justice. I'm doing well. I'm doing well. So, you know, I, I know a lot of times that we have agendas and we have things we want to talk about. Um, but I just think that so many people have heard your voice and don't really know who you are. Um, of course, we're not going to be using any names or, or just um, any direct facts that will link to who you really are because of this platform. However, I want these people to know who is the brilliant mind of, behind a lot of these uh, revolutionary podcasts. Um, so, I mean, I got a few questions, but, you know, we're going to do what we do, man. Um, okay. So, I just want to ask you first, uh, when did you come to prison? How old were you, that type of stuff? Uh, I came to prison in 1995. I was 18 years old. I had been 18 years old for six months. Um, I had just moved to this state from the state of Texas. Um, the conditions that I was under at that time, I was still dependent on uh, uh, my my guardians. My uh, mother was in Texas, and my uh, stepfather was here in the state here, and I depended on them for residence and. Uh, Pretty much everything else. I was still considered a kid in every respect. All right. And uh, when did you become a Latin king? Um, I became a Latin king. I joined the nation in 1997, July 5th to be exact. I was in Marion Correctional Institution at that time. Um, currently uh, serving a life sentence. That was um, the reward I received for the conviction of first degree premeditated murder. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about, you know, what brought you to prison and your sentence and, and how it's structured and stuff? Because, you know, so many different states have so many different laws and so many different ways that they treat uh, juveniles and ages and, and just um, even even different murder charges. You know, so many different ideas of murder has changed from state to state. So, uh, I mean, if you want, if you, if you want to talk about that a little bit. Sure. Um, I know that... Um Along with the, 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 the variations in how different states perceive uh, different crimes or degrees of crimes or what have you, I believe society standards have evolved as well. Um, I had the circumstance of uh, attending a house party. I was, uh, uh, you know, fairly considered someone unfamiliar with who was at the party. I, as I had only lived here at the time maybe two months, uh, an approximation. Um, again, I was 18 years old. We were hanging out, having fun, partying, drinking. Uh, we took some codeine pills, smoked some uh, some reefer, and drank some Southern Comfort, amongst other things. Um, this was an incident that um, this wasn't a robbery. This wasn't gang related. This wasn't a, a crime of passion where I found 
someone uh, sleeping with uh, my significant other or anything that even remotely uh, related to what would be considered the idealistic crime for someone of, of my age. Um, an argument had ensued between the group of kids that I was with and a nearby neighbor about the level of noise. I was approximately 45 feet away from the argument and really I was unaware that they were even arguing. Um, as a result of this argument, apparently a threat was made by the victim that um, he was going to show the group of kids and he came back with a weapon in his hand that was mistaken to be a gun. Uh, it was called out that he had a gun and um, I looked in the direction again 45 feet away at midnight at, uh, at the corner of the street and I seen a man pointing something in my direction, everybody running, screaming he had a gun, and he was shot. Um, as a result of that incident, uh, ultimately I was convicted of first degree premeditated murder. Um, there are circumstances in my case dealing with evidence that because no one testified to, uh, the state was permitted to paint an inference, and that inference was that I committed premeditated murder opposed to uh, what really took place. Um, different things have come out since then, uh, laws concerning juveniles, uh, you know, the, the advancements in the science and the studies of, of, of the brain and its development, um, but because the, currently the lion is still at 18 years of age, uh, that, you know, supposed to determine adulthood or maturity from immaturity, um, those things that have occurred since then have not um, served to, to, to help me in my cause. Um, along with those, you have, uh, you know, the highly controversial stand your ground law was something that was passed in the state of Florida. That had been applicable in my time would have definitely benefited me, uh, where during my episode, uh, we as uh, citizens had an obligation to retreat under pretty much any and all circumstances. Um, that was changed by the stand your ground laws. However, the stand your ground laws were ruled non-retroactive, meaning that they were not to be applied to any case prior to the passing of that new legislation. All right, so this was the, the area that this party was happening. Was it a, was it a minority type area? Was it just mixed? Um, I mean, you don't have to say the city or whatever if you don't want to. But was it was it you know what was what was kind of the demograph uh, in this in this area? Um, it was a um, what you might call a, a, a beach town. Okay. Um, I would say predominantly white um middle class um you know there wasn't any you know mansions or anything like that just a lot of little places up and down the beach um somewhere in central florida and uh your victim was white yes All right. yes he was white yeah so i mean we don't gotta really get into that no more. So you've been in prison for 25 years now, almost. Yes, uh, 25 years will be in the year 2020. 2020. All right. Um, now, when would you say that you became uh, revolutionized or radicalized, or um, you know, what led to that? Was that before prison? Was it after prison? I mean, I mean, was it before prison or after coming to prison, or was it something that kind of was already there? Um, you know. When I was when I was in my teens, um, prior to this incident here, I had a, a couple of other unrelated incidences in the state where I'm from, and each time I would find myself in uh, some type of trouble, um, I would encounter someone along the way who made an attempt to try to enlighten me, or educate me, um, or make me aware of um, the system and how it is it's uh, designed against. Um, minorities and people of uh, low-income communities and what have you. And this was in Texas? This was in Texas. However, none of those things really, you know, they never really took root. They didn't have a profound effect on me. It wasn't until later on in life after this particular conviction and my um, epiphany, if you will, once I entered the Florida Department of Corrections and was placed in the open population with um, these types that struck me as uh, something that I did not want to become. And when I was young, if I thought I wanted to be big and bad when I came to prison and I seen all these monster types who had no types of morals or values whatsoever, I realized that this was not the creature that I wanted to become. But I also realized that this was the creature that, that the system did want me to become.
um, for a number of reasons. At the same time, the uh, the Almighty Latin King Queen Nation presented um, presented a um, a structure for me, and it was one that I realized <coughs> at that tender age I was in need of. I needed parameters. I needed discipline. Uh, I needed a cause. I needed all these things, and that's what the nation provided. So, in joining the nation, I committed myself to learning more about uh, the culture of my ancestors, um, the history of Latin America, and so on and so forth. And in doing that, I was exposed to all these different truths and these different uh, political theories and what have you. And that's what, more than anything else, led or let me say solidified um, my decision to uh, continue to pursue uh, knowledge in that field, in those fields. And it, it's, when, it's when I realized that the seeds that were planted when I was even younger, when I was 12, when I was 13, when I was 14, all those different uh, occasions ago were starting to take root. They, were, they had already been planted, and it was just a matter of time and circumstance that would result in the blossoming of those ideas. So I want to back step a little bit. Um, when you say that when you first came into prison, because this is something I experienced too, um, and I think maybe this is a lot of our stories in here, man, when, especially coming in here so young, um, I want you to talk about a little bit what you said, how when you've seen all these, these, these people that would be considered, you know, um, without morals or w w without, without goals or just, you know, wanting to just be in prison and just experiences prison life mm -hmm. and you said I guess um, that it's something that the system wanted you to be or, or the system um, perpetuated these 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 ideas um, how? how how did you see that and what did you remember any events or anything that that was kind of like yo I, I just don't want to be who they're trying to make me be because I know it happened to me so many times you know so many times being in here so young, man, it just was like, I don't want my sentence or this prison to dictate who I am. Yes, absolutely. Um, I don't know if it was any one particular incident, and in, in, in equally, you know, there were so many different incidences, but there was something about the prison environment that kind of lifted the, the filter, you know, on the street. The idea of, uh, you know, criminality or some type of form of gangsterism, if you will, it's always glamorized. And <laughs> it was something that, because of that glamorization, I was not able to really see it for what it was. And when I mean what it was, I'm talking about the depravity of mind. Um, in prison, it was it was naked. It was unfiltered. It was right in your face. It was, this is not a pretty thing. The way of thinking is not a pretty thing. The, the the um, predatorial uh, ways and exhibitions, uh, prisoner against prisoner. The um, the lack of conscience. You know who who cares about this person, that person, or the other. Um, the so-called convict code and and really what it was rooted in. Um, I seen the isolationism, you know, the individualism, the collectivity, the idea of community did not exist here. And when I talk about this is what the system wants, this is what it wanted, this is more what I'm referring to than anything else. It was that, you know, there's only so many tear or chairs at the table. You know, only so many people can enjoy their piece of the so called American pie. And if you're not, you know, privileged to be one of those numbers, then there's only so many things left for you to, to, to become. And, and, you know, cannon fodder or, or, or some type of lab rat. And to so many, you know, people, we have become just that. These experimentations, um, societal experimentations, if you will, that are executed by the system, by the government. And it was in here that I began to really realize and see it for what it was. Would you would you say that these uh, low level pigs compared to like the big level pigs, like mm -hmm. these ones that actually um, create these laws and policies? Um, but would you say that these low level pigs, cor correction officers, and 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 um, I guess uh, uh, street pigs or slave catchers or whatever, would you say that they they help perpetuate this? Uh, uh, I guess um, idea that we are 
just, I guess they use the term Hillary, the horrible Hillary Clinton f founded this term as, as super predators. Would you say that the pigs in here um, um, perpetuate that idea too? Yeah, without a doubt. Um, I, I would say there's the this, this striking difference between you know what you may call the lower level pigs and the higher level pigs is that um, there's there's a prevalent lack of knowledge um, at the so-called lower level. Um, they're ignorant. Um, a lot of what they perpetuate has to do with ignorance. It's founded upon ignorance. Um, themselves, in many ways, um, are super predators. Um, you know that was part of the realization as well. Uh, coming into the system is seeing. Um, the apparatus, you know, the, the authorities for what they were and, and how they executed their, um, their desires uh, against other human beings. Um, you know, the prison environment is one that, on a psychological level, it's, it's, it's just something completely different than anything, at least that I'm used to um, in the greater society. And using them as an example, not only do they perpetuate, but they actually exemplify um, the super predator themselves. All right. So uh, I want to get back into um, when you were uh, radicalized, revolutionized, and this revolution of the mind you experienced. Um, mm -hmm. Would you say that there was any uh, monumental events that happened or, or um, literature that you would go back to and see yourself still going back to that helped, um, I guess, form your views or... Um, help you create your own views or just give you the ideas that that this is what is right to you um and like for me i always go back to george jackson it was for me it was always solid that brother it was my bible for years and years and years no matter how many times these pigs took this book from me i would find another way to get it and which i don't have right now and i'm in the process of getting it but um but i think that coupled with some of the almighty latin king queen nation literature uh, I think those two things are kind of what, um, I'll go back to, you know, King Blaze that wrote The Riders of the Storm, and um, he also wrote one of the first pamphlets I ever read that I would say radicalized me was um, ghetto, the evolution of ghetto-style organizations, mm -hmm. and it was put out by the Kansas Mutual Aid, and, you know, a lot of us used to get a lot of that stuff until it was deemed uh, gang paraphernalia, and now we're going to confinement for these same pieces of literature. Right. So, um, I just let me go back to the question that, what would you say any any events you could remember that or or any any literature that you would like to uh, reference to to give us an idea of um your belief system <laughs> i think um a combination of um uh, works and, and periodicals throughout the years um in the beginning um it was uh there was a paper called uh, or some type of magazine or another i forget I want to say it was CUNY that published it um, off, and it had a lot of uh, provoking articles in it. Um, it featured artwork by Kevin Rashid Johnson, which was the first time I had ever uh, ran across his name. And this was uh, around 2000. Um, MIM, the Maoist Internationalist Movement, had a publication that time called MIM Notes. Um, and it was revealing. And in fact, it featured a lot of articles by members of the Almighty Latin King Queen Nation. Um, that shed, you know, light and support on the reality that uh, the Almighty Latin King Queen Nation did believe in some form of revolutionary uh, politics and, and theory. Um, in addition to that, um, some of the work that I ran across uh, first uh, by way of uh, Ernesto Che Guevara, um, one of his works that was... Um, a collection of speeches that he had gave to uh, university students was uh, was um, impactful. Um, probably the most referenced book that I can recall is uh, The Pedagogy of the Oppressed by Paolo Freire, which um, it really defined for me what it means to be a revolutionary, um, to be an educator, um, to be dedicated to overcoming oppression and being dedicated to liberation and working hand to hand with the oppressed. All right. Um, so I, I kind of want to uh, get into some specifics, kind of like what are your views 
as far as politically. And I don't mean, you don't, I don't really, I'm not asking for you to tell me communist or socialist or um, internationalist or uh, leftist, but just if you could sum it up in a few sentences, um, what does ECC 1-1 believe in? Um, what I believe in is, is probably a broader question than what you intend. I think somewhere more along the lines of, of answering what it is that I pursue or what it is that I, I seek to do, maybe that's somewhere a little bit more close to what you're referring to. Um, I enjoy educating. I enjoy sharing. I enjoy um, enlightening. I enjoy presenting an alternative uh, way of thinking, an alternative method, um, providing information that otherwise would not be available, um, and being able to relate with... Uh, a class of people that has really been under attack so gruesomely by the government uh, with all these different labels and, and, and categorizations um, so that what I believe uh, in, in, in line with the nation, the Almighty Land King Queen Nation, uh, to be uh, evident is that it is amongst this class, these, these lumping proletarians, if you will, that uh, our revolutionaries will rise and I have the ability to relate with fellow Lumpen because I myself represent that class. And uh, with that awareness and the information that I've been able to uh, come across throughout my years of study, um, I've dedicated myself to making myself available to not just members of the nation, but members of my class. Um. What do you feel, and I don't really mean what do you feel, I guess the better question is, um, how much has the Zapatista movement or the EZLN um, helped, I guess, mold your, your I guess, uh, uh, theory, political theory, and even um, the idea of armed struggle? The EZLN actually uh, had an impact on me more than anything else, and, and anything else in, in the respect of prior to my exposure to Su Comandante Marco's work, uh, the official spokesman of the EZLN, or at least at that time. Um, prior to that, I was leaning towards the um, Leninist Vanguard Party uh, frame of mind, and um, it was because of Su Comandante Marcos and his work and the EZLN and what they were doing and how they were doing it that I found maybe spiritually, if you will, I was kind of expanding and I was opening up more to broader ideas um, in, in the opposition to uh, oppression and exploitation. And the realization was that, especially as a member and representative of the Almighty Latin King Queen Nation, we do not necessarily um, subscribe to any one, you know, theory. And I had known that, but it wasn't until the study of that particular work and their actions that I realized, wait a minute, I'm showing some type of favoritism here. Let me take a look at this. And in doing so, I was touched. I was touched with um, a feeling of camaraderie, um, uh, almost a spiritual essence feeling. Um, me, myself, uh, I have half of my, my family um, are Mexican-American. And have a history and roots with uh, these people and these people and their work have managed to touch me in a way that I could probably only describe as uh, spiritual. And I think something we've talked about in the past why I also and I think a lot of when we uh, a lot of the lumpens when there's this criminal class when we um, find these movements and, and especially this one, when we can ascribe to them, um, because something that really touched me when it came to the Zapatista movement and why I'm just really into it is because they, I think there was a quote, I can't remember if you gave it to me, if I read it somewhere, about how they were nobodies until they put their masks on, uh -huh. and then they became somebody. Right. So that's almost the same as us mm -hmm. in here. We're nobodies. We are part of the, the, the criminal class that is never supposed to be anything until 
we do things like this, put out these podcasts until we put on this mask mm-hmm. and 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 get behind enemy li- enemy lines, mm-hmm. and then we become somebody. So that's always been something that touched me. That it's almost the opposite of what masks mean. Mm-hmm. You know, when we um, go behind these enemy lines, when we are are fighting for the things we believe in, we mask up, and then everyone wants to know who the hell we are. And that's what's always touched me when it came to the Zapatista movement. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, so um, <clears throat> do you do you do any uh, do you write? Do you write poetry? Do you write books? Do you um, make music? Do you draw? Do you paint? Do you? Is there any things that that besides just the revolutionary aspects, or maybe these um, different uh, uh, I guess ways to express yourself? And, and your ideas and your mind and just how you're feeling sometimes, man. Is 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 there anything that you um, like to do when it comes to art? Without a doubt, um, I've always had an artistic side that came out in my use of the written word. Um, I I I dibble and dabble with poetry a little bit in my teens. Um, later on, I got into writing articles um, for various newsletters and publications. <coughs> I wrote leaflets, pamphlets. I was an avid writer. Um, I've had things published in Canada, here in the United States, um, that are posted on the internet. Um, I've even assisted in a number of our own periodicals uh, from the Almighty Latin King Queen Nation throughout the years. Um, a number of those things that resulted in consequences that I had to pay um, that resulted in long-term administrative confinement or what have you. I don't write to the extent that I used to. Um, A number of things have changed um, uh, with the inclusion of um, tablets now and our ability to um, send and receive emails. Um, It's made it a lot more convenient than sitting down with pencil and pad and, uh, you know, etching out something along those lines. Um, Poetry, I still stuck with it. I learned uh, to write metrical poetry, and uh, it's always... um, an exhilarating challenge for me. I enjoy writing poetry. So even though I don't write to the extent that I used to, yes, yeah, just to this day, I do express myself artistically by um, by means of the written word. Yeah, um, and you know, there's something else too, because I, I post some poets, poems on here, and I do a lot of spoken word poetry, and um, but I think something that has influenced uh, me a lot too is hip-hop. Mm. You know, um, has, has hip-hop helped um, influence any of your ideas or like for me growing up it was Wu-Tang and these ideas that, that, that Wu-Tang was pushing out there which led into of course so many other things right but I always go back to when I was like nine years old and I told my old boy that I wanted a pair of uppies and, 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 and the, the, the Wu-Tang 36 Chambers album wow. and this, these are things that like have always I've always held a, a, a deep place in my heart, and hip hop has, especially what they call conscious, conscious rap. Man, um, has 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 any type of music, uh, I guess, spoke to you in in, in, in that type of way? Without a doubt, I'm I'm, I'm definitely a part of the hip hop nation myself. Um, I come from an era that was before yours, and I also come from um, uh, a time whenever we were. Uh, strongly divided in the hip-hop world between uh, the East Coast and the West Coast. Um, I was a big West Coast kid. I listened to... You're kind of telling people your age now, partner. <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, a, a big fan of what they dubbed uh, gangster rap. And the thing about it was is that even back then, you know, gangster rap had a message. Um, it was coded in violence or what have you, but that was Fuck the reality. the police. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There was definitely a message there. And it didn't dawn on me then, you know, what, you know, dawned on me later on in life uh, about the power of music and the message itself. In fact, I can recall uh, one of the times I was in a, in a halfway house. I, I believe I was 15, 16 years old, and there was a, uh, an instructor there by the name of Mr. Bolden. Mr. Bolden is one of the very few people in my life who I can recall by name who had an effect on me. Uh, Mr. Bolden had uh, asked me, you know, one time if I had listened to rap, and I told him, yeah. And he uh, he brought in a, a cassette, back when they had cassettes, <laughs> by uh, a guy named Paris. And Paris was, uh, had been a, previously had been a member of the Black Panther Party. And um, 
I listened to his music, and to be honest with you, I, I didn't like it. I thought it was whack, whatever, this, that, and the other. It just wasn't what I was used to. But years and years and years later, you know, after all these different things have occurred, here I am in the Florida Department of Corrections when they came out with these, uh, these MP3s and MP4s. And I looked up this guy, Paris, because now I've, I've become enlightened. You know, I'm, I'm aware. I know what's going on. And I look up Paris because I remember this guy, Paris, and I listen to Paris. And I, now I, mean, I got a, all this Paris, you know, music and lyrics on my, on my, on my MP because Paris was the truth. Paris was talking about socialism. Paris was talking about capitalism. All these things that were going over my head at the time. You know, music has come a long way. Um, Hip-hop is... Uh, a venue. It, it, it is. It is. It's a powerful one, and it's one that needs definitely to be utilized more to uh, to get this message out. Um, and and hip hop has just evolved in so many different ways, um, from from the Parises to you know Dead Prez, Public Enemy, uh, to today's Kendrick Lamar's. You know, it's just there's so much potential there, and there's so many different ways of expression that are so beautiful to me. So yeah, without a doubt, music and hip hop has definitely had an impact on my life. All right, so I kind of want to go back to the uh, legal aspect. Do you currently have any um, appeals in or any post-conviction motions in right now? At present, I have nothing active within the courts. The last um, thing that I had filed was a request for a commutation of sentence that went before the clemency board. It stayed up there approximately five years before it was denied. And, and, explanation. And, and life in Florida is forever. Life in Florida is not, it is, it is not, not maybe I'll, I'll do 25 years, maybe I'll eventually get out on parole, even in 40 years. No, there is no consideration at all whatsoever for me to ever be released from the Florida Department of Corrections. I have been sentenced to die in the Florida Department of Corrections. I have been sentenced to live to the age of 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, as long as it takes for me to pass away in this life. So, um... Using that same mindset, man, and being in prison for almost 25 years now, just shy of 25 years, can you envision a future or even an eventual freedom? At times, yes. I can say that it has become more and more difficult. You know, when you come in, uh, your mind obviously is going to be saturated with thoughts relevant to being out there. Uh, 25 years in prison, uh, I spent well over half of my life incarcerated. Um, the mass majority of my life has been incarcerated. Um, so those thoughts are no longer uh, as saturated as they may have been at one point in time. And the visualization of me outside of this environment, outside of captivity, is one that becomes more and more pressing. It becomes more and more hard to actually conceive um, you know, you, you hear the term, I can only imagine, you know, well, imagine that. I can only imagine what it is like to live in the greater society anymore to this day. And uh, freedom, what, is, what does freedom mean to you? Can you explain freedom? Freedom definitely uh, is, is uh, how they say, subjective. <laughs> Depends on how you look at it. Um, you know, some people believe in the freedom to oppress others, and they call that freedom. Uh, some people, you know, believe in the freedom to uh, uh, make millions, if not billions, and trillions of dollars. And, and you know, some people um, would be stupefied at the freedom of just being able to select, you know, from an assortment of flavors that exceeds the number two. You know, I, I, the freedom you know, can be exhibited in so many different ways. The freedom to, to, to hold and care for a loved one and uh, vice versa. Um, the freedom to breathe clean air. Uh, the freedom to walk in one line without interruption. Um, freedom is something that definitely just can't be defined, at least by words alone, not by me. Hey, man, so I really just, you know, Time constraints are always rough on us, and, and I just, you know, there's so, still so much we can talk about. There's still so many much many, many more people that we can talk to in here, man, but I really, just really want to appreciate you uh, giving us this time, man. You've given us the, this, this, this mind of ECC-11, the heart, the, the, the soul. You know, we, we've traveled. We've traveled down one of the great minds in prison right now, and I just really, really 
want to encourage you, and not you, ECC1, one, but you to the listener. I want to encourage you to reach, not out, but reach in here. Reach in here and contact people. If anyone want to contact ECC11, they can hit me up. But it doesn't have to be him. Because there's plenty of ECCs in here. There's plenty of kings in here. There's plenty of people in here. There's plenty of jail law speaks and and, and, and in prison slaveries. And, and there are so many people in here that just have been lost. And I just really want to encourage everyone, man, to reach in, man. Reach into this class, man. Because maybe, maybe it's here where the answers are. Um, I want to reiterate one thing that my mentor here said throughout the whole idea of this. And it is, remember, pigs are super predators. All right? <laughs> hey, man, I love y'all, man. I, I, hey, man, I really appreciate you being here, man, and doing this, man. Hey. Always. Thank you for the opportunity. It, it means a lot to me to be able to uh, indulge in this new uh this new practice, um, like we discussed earlier, it was it was the written word before, and now it's it's becoming the spoken word for me. Straight up, man. Pigs are super predators, man. We love y'all, free world, man. We out of here, man. Behind the fences, in the trenches, we here. Shank Radio, baby. Mm-hmm.